Uh, Pat is UC President's Professor of uh, Philosophy at UC San Diego, recently gave up being chair of the department, and she's written, she co-founded with Paul uh, this, this wonderful field of neurophilosophy, and her latest book was Brainwise, which is widely available. Pat Jackson. Thank you so much. It's always really tough to follow Ronnie D'Souza, especially when everybody's really hungry. Um, but Ronnie, many of you will have rightly guessed, uh, had a, also a theatrical career. Um, and I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint Stuart Kaufman because uh, I can't say anything about things spiritual. It's just not in my temperament. Um, and it's also really not in my temperament um, to, uh, I mean, I can enjoy poetry, but, and I, I just admire Ronnie so much to be able to stand up and read a poem in front of people. I mean, I'm actually kind of embarrassed to read one to myself, but there you go. <laughs> oh, and I can't sing, but I actually agree about dancing, but we'll get on to that. All right. Um, there's two, roughly speaking, domains uh, in neuroethics. One has to do with applications of recent discoveries to the nervous system in various ways, certain kinds of interventions. I'm not so interested in that. What I am interested in is the second thing, and that is ethics itself as a biological and cultural phenomenon. But as I'm particularly interested in the brain, what I'm most curious about is what is it that we can understand from the point of view of neuroscience that might help us to understand how it is uh, that brains make it possible for people to do things that are seemingly not in their own interest. So a number of topics are of great interest to me here. One concerns the neurobiological nature of decisions and choices. And interestingly enough, that is a domain to which neuroscientists can uh, now begin to make progress. And you can actually record from single cells in various parts of the cortex as a decision-making task uh, is undertaken. I also want to understand the neurobiological nature of moral motivation, and finally, something about the nature of self-representation and self-control. The topic that I'm going to focus on here has to do with moral motivation, and on other occasions, I can talk about the other things. It's been known, of course, by naturalists and biologists for a long time that many, many kinds of animals are social. Here we see ants cooperating to build a shelter. Many people have understood quite well the dynamics of social behavior in wolves where, and I think this is where it begins to get really interesting, only the dominant pair are the breeding pair. The others are quite capable of breeding, but in actual fact do not, though they will take part in the hunt and so forth. This has always suggested to people that there must be a neurobiological account of uh, the nature of social behavior. Now, although molecular biologists and evolutionary biologists understood quite well that we should be able to link something about the nature of genes to cooperative and sharing and mutually defending behavior, what we really need to understand is the role of the brain in all that. How is it, because the brain is the thing that it is between the genes and the behavior. Now, all of this changed quite recently, and some of you know this story um, already. If you don't, I think it's, if I may sort of paraphrase Peter Atkins this morning, knowing the story of the voles, no, sorry, not knowing the story of the voles is sort of like not knowing who the Beatles are. Um, but in any case, the story broke, actually it broke with um, an observation, a very casual observation about the nematode C. elegans that only has about a thousand neurons. And the observation was that under conditions of food scarcity, you see two very different kinds of behavior amongst C. elegans. Some tend to cluster together and some move apart. And it was discovered that the main difference between those two and how they behave under these conditions has to do with oxytocin. Well, that immediately 
caused consternation because oxytocin had been well known for its role in other parts of the body. In females, in mammals, for example, and it was well known in the case of humans, it's involved in parturition and in lactation. And so people began to wonder if there might be something special about this particular peptide in social bonding. And in fact, this picked up on something that Paul McLean, who, who um, Ronnie also mentioned, uh, something Paul McLean had said, but that actually Darwin had said before, which was something about the social behavior of mammals might be traceable to the parent-offspring connection. And that it's the broadening and expanding of that connection to wider members of the group that constitutes an important development in social behavior. Now the story of the voles, I'll just go through quickly because I did this also last year. But the story of the voles, for those of you who don't know, goes roughly like this. There's many species of voles, many, and there are in particular prairie voles and montane voles. One behavior that distinguishes them is that prairie voles are monogamous pair bonders. After the first mating, they bond for life. Montane voles are promiscuous pair bonders. There are some other differences pertaining to rearing of pups, which is a much more cooperative enterprise for prairie voles. In montane voles, it largely falls to the females. So one question uh, was, what might be the difference between the brains of prairie voles and montane voles to sustain this really quite interesting behavior. Now, monogamous pair bonding had been seen in the biological domain in other species. In birds, for example, it's quite well known. Canada geese uh, tend to mate for life, but it's also known uh, in, in other mammals. Now, the idea that oxytocin might play a role here occurred to a number of people at about the same time. Um, partly because they were intrigued by the social bond um, between mother and child. And the, and the realization through rat studies that if you take a female rat who has not had babies, is not in estrus, nothing of that kind, and you inject oxytocin into her brain, what she will do is go to a neighboring female who does have pups, and she'll begin to make a nest, take those pups, and behave for all the world as though she had, uh, had pups. 